what's harder, CrossFit or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Oh my gosh, what a loaded <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> what a great place to start, actually. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty clever. Um, what is harder? Ooh, ooh. I think that they both have big barriers to entry. Like, I, I and I know this sounds super, but it's very. Um, you'd have to narrow down the question, meaning like, what's harder to start, to become an expert at, to uh, reach the highest levels? So, for example, if you were to say, "Hey, which one's harder to start?" I think jujitsu is harder to start. Which one is harder to um, get like mediocre at? probably, uh, I'd say jujitsu as well. Like it's hard to get mediocre. There's so many skills you can get mediocre at CrossFit, but to become a black belt or even a red belt, let's just say where you're like at the CrossFit games championship level compared to like a red belt in jujitsu, I'd say it's, you know, I'd say it's going to be CrossFit because you, you, it, the, you know, in, in jujitsu, you get belted based on like tenure abilities, whatnot to become a black belt in CrossFit. There's hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to make it to the CrossFit Games just to make it is, I would say, getting your, you know, black belt. And that's very difficult to do. So I guess jujitsu is harder to start, harder to get good at. And CrossFit is harder to like actually earn the highest ranking belt. Hmm. Interesting answer. I, I would have thought the barrier barrier to entry for jiu-jitsu would have been easier than CrossFit based on maybe some of the lifts and, and some of the sort of uh, technical components of CrossFit. So what, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is the opposite? I mean, I think that's a really good perspective. Um, I would say that with CrossFit, you look at it and you're like, okay, you have the, these complex lifts, you have these handstands, it's whatever. But that's that's just one expression of CrossFit. I mean, CrossFit in, in, in its entirety is just like high intensity workouts. So you could do that with box jumps and rowing and burpees. And really anybody could kind of walk into a gym and feel pretty comfortable, I'd say, if you have a good coach. I don't know if I could say the same thing about jiu-jitsu, meaning you could have a really good coach in jiu-jitsu. And um, but as soon as you put your hands on another person, it, it, it is a barrier. It's uncomfortable, especially I would say, and I can't speak from experience, but I would imagine for a woman to walk into a CrossFit gym would be a little bit easier because you could work at your own pace. You don't have to put anything physically touching you, but then you go into a jiu-jitsu gym where it's 95% men, or let's just say 80% men. And now you're required to like get into positions with them. So that's why I would say there's a little bit of a higher barrier to entry there is because that physical touch yeah yeah no i agree i think it's well with crossfit everything's scalable so you can go in like you said and you can do the most basic movements at the start and then build up build up the intensity and and and, and the complex uses of moves exactly yeah i mean the thing about crossfit is if you go into a gym it's like you could start off with um let's just say you take a complex skill like a handstand push-up or a muscle-up there's variations for everybody um in jujitsu you know getting an arm bar uh, there's not really variations like you either get the arm bar or you don't but i think where jiu-jitsu has a higher barrier is again even getting yourself into the position of getting an arm bar it just requires a mindset and a dedication of time right like you to 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 get your first arm bar on somebody is probably going to take at least 6 months of training like assuming everybody's like newer or whatever like you're not going to get an arm bar like really, really for a while. And so it requires like this dedication to the craft, this consistency and this uncomfortableness that I think CrossFit uh, doesn't have as much. Now, I would say that both of those sports compared to other fitness models, definitely both of them have a higher barrier because of the complexity piece. Yeah. Okay. And I guess thinking about the entry. So a, a lot of people that I've spoken to and I think Danny's an example and, and me back in the day when I first started jiu-jitsu, especially if they've come from another sport, they they often, and certainly a different martial art, like a striking martial art, they often have this like humbling experience where, you know, they, they maybe sort of grapple against a high level practitioner for the first time and suddenly have this awakening moment where they're like, oh my God, this is very powerful and I feel like a child. Obviously yourself, mate, being a, a very elite athlete, um, very elite CrossFit athlete, and, and therefore having, you know, sort of physical attributes beyond what most humans have. Did you experience that or was that something that you didn't experience? 
Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when I first got into jiu-jitsu, um, you know, I was, I was very physically fit, but I, but it was a very humbling experience. So my background is at 15, I started in a traditional health club. I was introduced to CrossFit when I was about 17, 18. At the time I was exposed to as well, uh, Muay Thai before that. So I was doing Muay Thai for a couple of years and, and Sancho, which is like Chinese kickboxing. I was doing Sancho and Muay Thai when I was like 18. And then for a couple of years, I lost a lot of weight because coming out of high school, I was pretty big. I was going to go play football. I ended up not playing American football. Uh, I ended up not playing, but I was big. I was like 260 pounds. And right now I'm 212. And that's pretty much where I ended up, you know, kind of finding my, my balance. But I used Muay Thai as a way to kind of lean out. And I loved the art. Um, but then I got into CrossFit and I kind of left martial arts for a while as I competed professionally there because I didn't want to get injured. And then once I retired from the sport and I got into jiu-jitsu, to your point, dude, it just doesn't matter. It's like you, you, you think you're so physically fit, but then you'll have like a, you know, mediocre sized blue belt just take you to school. Um, and it, that was, that was very eye opening for me. And I think that most people with my background, they go into jiu-jitsu and one of two experiences happen. Option A, they get their ass kicked. You're like, wow, whatever just happened, I do not want that to happen again. Teach me, show me, how can I get better? Other people are like, dude, this stuff's whack. Like I'm out. And I, I think that, um, you know, having that mindset of like every day on the mats, man, it doesn't matter. Now I've been doing jujitsu now for eight, eight years. Um, I, I roll often with a lot of really tough people and there's always ways to get humbled even eight years later. Yeah, true that. And and I guess wh where where was the entry to jiu-jitsu? Like how did you come across it and why did you transition it across to jiu-jitsu and not back to Muay Thai or something like that? I used to sublease space to a jiu-jitsu uh I used to sublease space to jiu-jitsu gym and uh so at, at one of our gyms I used to sublease and so I, I used to watch them and I used to be like wow, that was like human chess. It was very intriguing to me. Um and so I always told myself that when I retired from the sport I would get into jiu-jitsu. One of the reasons why I got into jiu-jitsu so with Muay Thai, I loved it. I loved the striking. I loved the fact you had all these different weapons from fists to elbows to knees to kicks, but I did not love the sparring. Um, I, you know, when you, when you get kicked really hard in the shin, like it just sucks. Um, I remember one day I got kicked in the face and I was like, dude, that sucks. It just sucks, mm. you know? Um, and so when I finished CrossFit, I was like, look, Muay Thai, it's, it's super aggressive. It's great. But where am I at in my life? At the time, I was like, I don't know, 30 years old. I had two kids. I'm like, what am I trying to do from a self-defense perspective? I want to do something I could do for the rest of my life, number one. And I want to do something where I could control somebody. The striking, I already had some framework in compared to most. And so I said to myself, what is my intention with self-defense? Well, I'd love to be able to just control somebody. I don't need to strike them. I just want to be able to control. And that's what really kind of drew me to jiu-jitsu was the fact that I watched that art when I subleased and the fact that my intention was to control and not to necessarily hurt. Now, hurt if necessary, but that's not my intention. Yeah. So it's um, – obviously, you competed, I think, in jiu-jitsu, haven't you? You won the US jiu-jitsu open, I think. I, I've done – I've done – I think I've competed like five or six times. I've done local tournaments. Uh, the biggest one I did, I did Master Worlds at Purple Belt. Um, okay. That was a that was a cool learning experience for me. Um, but yeah, I've won. I've won a lot of. I've won local tournaments, but not nothing, nothing grand, nothing, nothing to brag about. Yeah, okay. Because uh, I asked because you obviously mentioned self defense a couple of times there, and and obviously being uh, you know again such an elite competitor i was curious to know if the the reason for joining or starting jiu jitsu was to compete and potentially be a champion at that or whether it was simply just for self defense yeah no it, it, the the competition side for me is just a way to test my skills um and like i i plan i i want to compete at a uh, nogi worlds this year at brown belt um we'll see um it, it just here's the thing the competition side is exciting because it gives me something to chase down. The only issue for me on my journey is that when I'm preparing for competitions, I take it pretty seriously. Like I'm actually a week from now, I'm actually going to go battle Tim Kennedy in grappling, shooting and CrossFit, which would be fun. <laughs> but I'm no not, way. Yeah. I'm not like, uh, I'm just preparing by just doing the same stuff I do regularly. 
when I want to like get ready for master worlds or whatnot, I start training with guys like Mason Fowler. I start training around. I start really ramping up my training because I want to try and do well. I'm, I'm going there to win. I'm not going there just to show up. The problem with that is that sometimes that starts to impact the rest of my life. And I've had to put checks and balance on that where if I get hurt because I'm grappling all the time to get ready for a competition and I can't go play baseball with my son, like that bothers me. And so sometimes there's these two worlds where I have to be careful when I compete in jujitsu. One world is that I'm a competitor. I want to win. The other world is I'm a dad and I need to show up for my family. And so if I cannot allow this one, like I can't allow one to take over the other, which is why I haven't competed in about a year. And if I do, maybe I'll do master worlds. Maybe I'll just do a local competition. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And tell us about the, um, the master's world at purple belt. What was that experience like? I mean, it was, it was great. Um, you know, I, 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 I think my learning lesson there would have been, um, I knew some guys there for sure. Um, I probably would have in the future brought a coach. I think I learned, you know, cause I've, I've, I've competed professionally in CrossFit for about a decade. I competed, you know, many, many times in front of very large audiences. So I knew exactly what that anxiousness or that, that, that feeling would be. So controlling those nerves is not something that's new to me. So that was fine. It was more so like actually like the sport of jujitsu. I think that if I do it over again, um, I would be more encouraged to have a coach there telling me exactly what to do. I had coaches in the past. Uh, this tournament though, because it was in Vegas, I didn't. I had someone that was helping me out. I just I just couldn't hear them well, and it just wasn't the right fit for me at the time. Because me and this guy, I went through the first round. I was pretty dominant. I go to second round and. I thought I was being pretty dominant. So I, I go for a takedown. This guy was a judo guy. We're standing up. I didn't realize at the time that he was a judo guy until later on, like thinking back on it. And at masters, like the rounds are pretty short. You know, I think you had five minutes. It's not a long time. And so we're standing up, we're grappling, we're grappling, or we're standing up. We're, we're trying to get a takedown. I end up taking him down, uh, kind of, and I got an advantage. And so at that point, there's like a minute left or something like that. And then he kind of gets an advantage. And I thought that I was the more aggressive one. I thought that I had won. And turns out that the referee gave a decision to the other guy. And it was hard for me because I had never had a sport of mine decided by a referee. You know, like it was either my performance or not. Like in CrossFit, like you either did the work or you didn't. So it was hard for me to not move on to the next round because of a referee. Now, that being said, it was my own fault that I let it be that close. So it was my fault that I did not submit the guy. And then there is no referee's decision. But my takeaway from that was that you got to go in there with the game plan and be willing to change relatively quickly. Because if what I was doing wasn't working for two, three minutes, I should have pulled guard and gone for a second position. It, 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 you know, that was my big takeaway. Mm. I guess that's, I, I'm guessing here because I've not really done a whole lot of CrossFit. That's, that's more Danny's thing. But I feel like competing in CrossFit versus jiu-jitsu is probably a little bit more straightforward. I guess there's a lot of tactics and strategy around jiu-jitsu more so than CrossFit. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, what I would say is that um, the tactics and strategy in CrossFit are you against a particular event, handstand walking, you name it. It's you against the event, and then you have to come up with your game plan on how you're going to execute on it. So it's in your control. Uh, jiu-jitsu, it's out of your control. The only thing that's in your control is preparing. But then once you prepare, you don't know if your opponent is going to pull guard. You don't know if he's going to go for a single leg. You don't know if he's going for a good double leg. You don't know if he's going to, you know, play De La Hiva or play side control. I mean, what or whatever, you know what I mean? So for that, you could create like patterns in your mind of what might happen and how you're going to react to it. But it's different than CrossFit where you say, hey, the event is this. I'm going to do this pace and this rep scheme. You can't do that in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, there's definitely a difference, I think, to the pace, it seems. And I guess to some degree, I mean, you can't ever get away from the chaos of, of an opponent. Um, but I guess with IBJJF tournaments, like the, the sort of Europeans and in, in, in the Masters Worlds, there's obviously a particular rule set which, you know, can lead to certain tactics from your opponents and stalling. And obviously in the gi, it's more so you mentioned that obviously you're looking to do no gi, which is a little bit more fluid, I guess, in regard to its style. Do you have like a preference, gi or no gi? And would you consider doing, I don't know, like submission only where you don't need to worry about the points as much? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I uh, It's funny because I, I roll about 80, 90% in a gi. 
Um, but I actually think I, I probably prefer it, but I think I'm better at Nogi just because I'm more dynamic. I'm, I, I could, you know, move around more. Um, but you know, it, it brings up this really interesting point about grapplers who don't also train strength conditioning. I think it's a huge, huge miss that you have guys who roll jiu-jitsu who think that's all they need. Um, I think that, you know, if you're working the techniques, that's absolutely critical. But if you're not also off the mats, improving your strength conditioning, you're really missing out in particular for no gi. Like if you're no gi, dude, there's no way to slow somebody down really. Like you, if someone's really throttling on you, you want to have the condition to be able to keep up. Now, look, let's face it. If you're a black belt against a white belt and severely deconditioned black belt, you're still going to kick the white belt's ass. Like that's, that's clear as day, probably blue belt, probably purple belt, maybe even brown belt. But once you get similar skill levels, it really starts to play a big role on how your strength conditioning is. And I think people are missing out on this theory where you have guys who are really good on the mats, but they don't expose themselves to enough getting in the red zone because they're so technically advanced compared to other people they roll with. And that works for a long time. But then all of a sudden they meet somebody who has the same capacity as them uh, from a skill perspective. And now that conditioning does play a big factor. We were just talking about that today. When our, our coach was saying that to Paul, that if they're if they're similarly, you know, you should roll fatigued quite regularly because once you're fatigued, then you know that that skill and and you still got to operate while under duress. So, like, if someone is at a similar skill level and you're never exerting yourself, then someone comes in and they're as good as you. You know, if you're not used to doing it and they are, they're going to kick your ass. Yeah, he was almost yeah. making the point around like a confidence thing as well. So if you're if you're used to rolling and and doing well without getting out of breath, you know, his his thinking was that there's still a little bit in your mind somewhere that if you were fatigued, would you question your technique? And by putting yourself in that point of fatigue and testing your technique, then you you have your answer. Yeah, and, and I think here's the hard part, guys. Like if you roll at a gym, it depends where you're at in the world. I'm very fortunate that where I live in the Bay Area, I have exposure to a lot of really good athletes. Like if I want to be in the belly of the beast, I could find it right now, right? Um, but there's some people that are going to be listening to this show who live in whoever knows where. And the guys at their gym, maybe they are the top dog. Maybe they have the top techniques. And the problem with that is, is that you especially, the, the, jujitsu is one of the rare sports I could think of that the better you get, the the better you get technique wise, the more it encourages you to be in poor shape. So I'll, I'll, I think I could rate, frame that right. Jiu-jitsu is a sport where the better you get technique wise, the more, whether it's by design or, I mean, it's not by design, but the more it allows you to get away with having terrible strength conditioning because you become so technological, te uh, technique, technical. And I think that that's something that we should reflect on because when you're an athlete and all things are even, you're good. But all of a sudden, um, if you find someone who has the same technique as you, but their conditioning is way better, you're going to be smoked. And so I think if you're not getting off the mats and hitting assault bike intervals, and I think if you're not hitting like AMRAPs and EMOMs and stuff like that off the mats, you're missing out on a, on a critical piece for your development. Yeah. So you, so you think that off the mat sort of conditioning is sort of more valuable than maybe doing, I don't know, like a shark tank or, or doing really hard rounds, multiple rounds. Do you think there's a difference? Well, okay. I'll, I'll make this analogy. If you're an athlete right now listening, who's a, you know, good level, medium level blue belt, let's just say, right. Medium level blue belt. I think that if your conditioning sucks, like, like I have guys and I'm sure you've seen this too. I'll get them in side control and they'll tap just because I'm sitting there and I have pressure on them and they can't breathe. Like that, if, if that's you at a mediocre blue belt and you find yourself tapping because you're just literally out of breath, I think that individual in their overall jiu-jitsu game would get more from just showing up for technique work that day and hitting like a 10, 12 minute hard workout, you know, five days a week than they would if they just like, constantly we're trying to get in and get roles. And then they're trying to hold people in positions they find. Like, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when you look at your development as an athlete and you have technique over here and strength conditioning over here, if you're way deficient at either area, you have an obligation to try and raise them both up together and then continue to go up on the same, uh, uh, you know, playing field. Yeah. 
And I think from an injury perspective as well, being stronger oh. and fitter will benefit you massively. Yeah, I mean, a lot of athletes, you know, back to your point, Paul, was Shark Tank, okay? Let's let's make no mistake about it. Shark Tank is extremely difficult, highly aerobic and anaerobic taxing. No question about it. You know, I've been in the red there and just like where you just like, you just got nothing left, right? 100%. But I think something that we don't talk enough about is um, building in like an anti-fragile, like making your body resilient. And I think that if you don't add an external load, you're missing out on your body's ability to become more resilient to injury. You know, if you look at it through three factors, right? You have muscle growth. We need to put on more muscle, more, more, uh, more muscle, period, to, to get more contractile potential. We need to make sure that we're working through long ranges of motion to increase our flexibility and range of motion through positions like things like full range of motion squats, full range of motion thrusters, things like that. So you're really working the, the extremities of the ranges of motion. And then finally, right, you got to increase your endurance. And I think that jujitsu does a great job on the endurance side for sure. And, um, and I'd say probably anaerobic as well, like, like this short burst, but where I think it lacks is this exposure to end ranges at loading um, and also just purely putting on muscle to support that joint. And so I think we need to get off the mat to do that type of stuff. Yeah, I, I guess the other thing with like a shark tank as well is, I guess, to Danny's point with the injuries and everything, if you're under fatigue and you're trying to sort of move yourself through those ranges that you just talked about, then the risk of injury is massive versus being shark tanking yourself on an assault bike, as you say where you're in control of the, you know, your, your, your body's mechanics at least. So the answer is you need both, right? I just think that if you only have one or the other, you're missing out. I think people that are just doing strength conditioning and CrossFit, like if we have an app for that, we, we love, it's called train hard. If all you're doing is our train hard workouts, that's it. That's fine. As long as you realize in the grand scheme of your overall fitness, there will be deficiencies in certain areas. One of them being self-defense. And if you're okay with that, that's fine. Right. The same thing goes for a grappler though. If you are just doing jujitsu, you have to realize there's going to be deficiencies in other areas. You're going to be really good at snap downs and flexible in these positions. You're going to be really good at those things and that's awesome. But where you're probably going to be poor at is, you know, maybe uh, doing a pull up, right? You, you, you're, you're used to being rounded over. You're not used to opening. You're, you're probably going to be poor with just pure strength perspective. And so what I look at is I look at the overall archetype or the overall athlete and say, what can I do to get myself as fit as possible for as long as possible? And for me, it's a combination of things that are going to help me be not just one linear, you know, like you take like a, a triathlete, incredible, incredible at this linear single modality phenomenal. But then you'll start to find that they might have things like plantar fasciitis, IT band issues because they're 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 working in a in a singular path. If you take them off that path and you have them do other things, I think they're going to get even better in that thing, right? So that's kind of my argument with jiu-jitsu is like, dude, if you're crushing on the mats, hell yeah, but let's get you off the mats doing some other stuff and you're going to probably even crush it even more on the mats. Yeah, it's very, it's very true, mate. And and we've had a, we've had this conversation a couple of times. In fairness, on on this podcast with various people, and and both Danny and I do do certainly strength work and a little bit of conditioning outside of of jujitsu as well. The argument we often get, of course, is is people are busy, right? And it's it's how you triage what things to do. I mean, what what do you think if you think about strength and then kind of maybe sort of anaerobic conditioning, flexibility work, um, and then obviously your skills training, your jujitsu. Um, you know, where would you kind of order them in importance? Well, I think, I think, I think the question lies, the answer lies in like the question of what is important to you. So like, if you are trying to be a world-class jujitsu athlete, that's your goal, right? I am trying to win 80 cc's. Well, exposure to technique is absolutely critical. And then obviously building up capacity is critical, but you're going to have more time and you're gonna have to have a lot more time to both because you're trying to be the best in the world. Now, if you say, okay, I'm a busy dad of multiple kids. I'm trying to be a working professional. I only have, you know, four hours a week to train. Okay. Well, what are your goals? Are you trying to be overall fit to keep up with your kids? Well, if that's your overall goal, then I'd say doing three days of strength conditioning 
And maybe one day of grappling is good. But if you say, hey, I have four hours a week as a dad, but I'm really interested in getting better at jiu-jitsu, I'd probably do two or three days a week of jiu-jitsu and add in one day of strength conditioning. So I really think it depends on the individual, what their goals are, and how much time they have. Um, but what I would say is that regardless, you want to be balanced and well-rounded and recognize that if your goal is one way, you're going to have deficiencies somewhere else. Like if you're trying to be, if for me, I was trying to be the fittest on earth, CrossFit Games, trying to win that every year. I knew I had deficiencies in my self-defense. I knew I had deficiencies in shooting firearms or name the other thing because I didn't expose myself to it. And I was okay with that. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it definitely comes down to obviously the, yeah, sort of the case-by-case -case needs. In regard to like a, a strength conditioning session, what does that, yeah. what, would you, what would you typically do? What does your week look like in regard to your split of training and then also your S&C, but also the S&C session itself? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, to answer your question a little bit more thoroughly, um, originally, I, I, I know it sounds fluffy, but the individual has to understand what is their why, what are they trying to accomplish? What is the big reason why they're doing this? For me, as a dad, I care about, I train so I can protect and provide. That's very important to me. I want to be able to run, jump, climb, lift. Yes, fight if necessary, but those other things are much more common from a protect perspective, meaning it's highly likely that one of us here maybe has to go run after a kid someday or go lift something up. That's that's probably likely. What's unlikely is you, any of us on this right here getting into a physical altercation. It's, it, it might happen. And even less likely would be having to use some type of firearm, right? That would be like way out here. So if, if the protect is a key piece for me, I need to have the physical fitness to be able to do that above all else. That's at the bottom of the pyramid. And then provide, you know, we talk a lot about being able to provide experiences for my kids. And if I can't play with them because I'm injured because I overtrained, if I can't do the thing, that's a problem for me. And so once I recognize my why, which is train, protect, provide, anything that's outside of those goals, it's, it's impacting my ability to reach them. So if I'm overtraining and my hands are ripped because I did 5,000 pull-ups and I can't throw a baseball with my son, I got to put myself in check, right? Or I go for that extra rep in training that I knew I shouldn't have, but now I tweaked my knee and I can't go run after him. That's a problem. So that's how I've evolved. Whereas five years ago or 10 years ago, if you had asked me, I'd be like, bro, I'm trying to win the games. I'm going to go for that extra rep 10 times out of 10. So back to your question about training. I believe the most effective way to train would be at minimum three days a week, one hour a day. If that's what you had for strength conditioning, I would prioritize an appropriate warm up where you're looking at things like increasing core body temperature and working through a range of motion, meaning get you a little sweaty and work through ranges of motion, you know, squats, push-ups, opening the shoulders, et cetera, right? That's number one. You got to, you got to prime the motors. After the motors are primed, I would do some type of fundamental strength session, either a pull, a push, or a squat. So those would be things like bench press, uh, shoulder press, uh, deadlift, uh, power clean, um, or back squat, front squat, et cetera. And I would be doing it in sets no less than rep schemes of three to five, no less. I would never, I would never. Um, I, me wouldn't be going for one rep maxes ever because they're not in alignment with where I want to go in the future of protect and provide. I don't need a one rep max. If I could do, if I could do five reps at 400 pounds, like I'm probably okay. Right. Um, and then if you want to add in tempo to make it even more difficult, so time under tension. So that would be the, the structure so far. You have a nice warm up, 15 minutes, you have a nice strain session, 15, 20 minutes, and then you get into some type of conditioning workout. And I think that there's two ways I look at these. One is uh, AMRAPs, meaning as many reps as possible. The other would be an EMOM, every minute on the minute. I think both are extremely effective ways to train, the most effective ways to train, actually. An AMRAP would be an example of five push-ups, uh, you know, seven sit-ups, 10 squats, AMRAP, 20 minutes, as an example. During that time, you're present, you're focused, you're trying to get as many rounds as possible. Another example would be my favorite, 15 burpees every minute on the minute for 10 minutes. That's a great aerobic, anaerobic, just, just killer, where every minute you're trying to accomplish a task and the clock is your training partner. That's the key, 
right? So you're by yourself, your clock is a training partner. With other people, they're your training partner. So that's the way I'd look at it. I would go warm up, strength work, and then some type of Metcon conditioning that works uh, works in balance. A pull, a push, a squat, a press. There you go. And I'd probably hit that 12 to 20 minute time domain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and are there any exercises that you typically avoid now you're doing jujitsu, like the, the Olympic snatch, for example, does that still play a part in your training or have you taken that out? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, uh, I typically have taken out things like handstand pushups in particular, kipping handstand pushups. You will not see me do. I just, they're just not bang for the buck for me. I'm just not interested in kind of slamming my head down. I'd rather just do shoulder press. Um, I rarely do full squat snatches as of lately. And then I rarely do muscle ups. Um, I no, still I muscle expose ups. myself to them every now and then, but not really. I just, the utility and going back to why I train, it has to align. And so again, you know, I, I apologize if this sounds fluffy, but you really got to ask yourself, like, what am I trying to actually do? And if your training is not in alignment with that, then you got to fix it. Yeah, I completely agree, mate. I've, I thought the same. I was when I, I've only been doing jujitsu coming up two years, and for my first probably eighteen months, mate, I couldn't I couldn't get off the mats, and I was feeling like little niggles and injuries and bits and pieces. And I had this conversation with you, didn't I? And I said, you know, what am I doing it for? And then I, I took a step back, and then I really thought about my my S and C and my resistance training, and I basically just stopped doing it and reintroduced that. And I've I've genuinely never felt better. You know, I have. I have a bit more tr- time than most to train, but I'd now split my time more evenly to make sure I get my resistance training every day as well as my jujitsu. Whereas that, there was a point where I was just sacking off the the the, resi- the, the training because I was like, oh, I want to get back on the mats. Yeah, I think that sometimes so many people who get with that, I think they just get that obsession with the skills, don't they? So, um, so yeah, watch out for sure. One thing that you didn't mention too much, there, Jason, is is like sort of mobility or, or yoga or stretching or anything. Is, is, is that something that you incorporate as well? Well, I would say I would I would take that twofold. If someone is a jujitsu practitioner, I think you are getting a decent amount of range of motion in there from like. Like for example, when I'm pre-class or even during when the, when the coach is instructing, I'm sitting there, sitting on my heels. I'm sitting there working through 90, 90 stretches. I'm getting prepared because I'm on the ground. I'm barefoot. I'm connected to the floor. So I'm getting some of that there for sure. Um, but what I would say is that in most strength conditioning programs, if you're doing it right, you should be working and expressing the muscle and the joint through a full range of motion. Things like full range of motion, deep squats, right? you are taking the hip below parallel. You're working through it. When you reach overhead, you are getting extension. You're bracing your belly. You're in that extended position. Those expressions are, 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 are your mobility, right? But they're adding load to it. And what you'll find with most jujitsu practitioners who just do jujitsu at a high level, from my experience, is that they'll have a hard time even hanging from a pull-up bar because they're so used to not being in that, that position. And so the answer I would say is that with a good solid strength conditioning program, like what we provide through our app or you can find it elsewhere, you will get that full expression of those movements. If you want to add in additional work, like I love quad smashing. It's probably my favorite thing to do from a mobility perspective, which is to take a kettlebell or a barbell and roll it along your quad. Typically, most of my knee problems occur from just having tight quads. So you could add in stuff like that's individual, but in general, just the movement is going to be uh, is going to be the key. Yeah, I think you're spot on actually. But we spoke to uh, Cameron Shane, if if you're familiar with him, um, he's a uh, sort of yoga and, and jujitsu guy. Does the Budokan University, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. And he felt that jujitsu was uh, more strength based. So he felt that jujitsu was a type of strength training. And almost the opposite of you, he would then focus more on an equal amount of yoga versus jujitsu because he felt that you need to do as much stretching as you do strength work. And that was his approach. So it's interesting to get a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, look, his argument would be it's because you haven't, you have another person on you that you're trying to move. And my thing would be the, 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 you know, the definition of like strength training is, you know, incorporating an external load. Now, if you say the external load is the individual, Okay, I guess. Like, all right, I can wrap my head around that, but um I I don't think 
I think for most people, most of the time, they would look at jiu-jitsu as what fatigues out on them. Like, okay, here's a great question for you guys. Is jiu-jitsu strength? Well, when you're rolling, what burns out first? Your muscle stamina prerequisite pure strength or is it your lungs? Which one? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. Which one? Yeah, lungs Lungs for me. Long, uh, lungs, lungs for me. Mate, that lungs for me that. too. Now, is it because we know what we're doing? I, you can make a bunch of... I, I guess my position on this would be that I think jiu-jitsu is more of a aerobic-based exercise. Again, I understand the point there is somebody else there, but I think for most people, most of the time, it does not become... Uh, you're not building strength or at least, and, 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 and some people I think would argue you shouldn't be trying to build strength because you're trying to manipulate your body around the individual. You're not trying to bench press them off of you. You're trying to move around them so you don't have to bench press them off of you. But yeah, yeah, that'd be an interesting conversation with that guy. I'd love to talk to him about and understand his perspective on that. And you know, a lot of it too, guys is like the vantage point you come from. I mean, I come from CrossFit where I have spent decades learning from the best coaches in all types of fields from running, endurance, strength training, gymnastics. And then I found jujitsu. Um, but I did not have experience. Like I am not a yoga practitioner. So maybe if I was a yoga practitioner, I would look at it through a different perspective. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly what Cameron was, wasn't it? He was a yoga, yoga instructor, and then he was doing jujitsu along the way. And he's basically combined the two quite well. Um, and he works with some UFC athletes and, and bits and pieces, but a lot of the stuff he does with them is is pure mobility work, isn't it? And and you know it's it's really interesting. But I I think I'm a bit more leaning towards what you're saying, where where with regards to you know strength training over mobility. I think if I was to choose strength training or mobility, again I would choose strength training and then add the mobility stuff in through like what you said. I do exactly the same, and I think most people do, especially if you're conscious of your movement. Is that yeah. that static stretching and bit of stretching before you're actually rolling and then in the gaps and even after on my cool down old, old. and since I've done jiu-jitsu I'm way more flexible than I was before and that's without me actively doing it yeah I mean Dan you're getting me fired up because think about it like this right like imagine look at the competitors at ADCC let, let, let just visualize in your head Andre <laughs> Gaval, Gordon Ryan like just visualize what do they look like to you do they look like a this? yoga athlete or a power <laughs> athlete Power. I'm sure. just saying, yeah. like, like, and 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 look, there's exceptions. If you look at some of the maybe a, a little bit of the smaller guys, and is flexibility important? Absolutely. But when you look at the pound for pound, Yuri, you, I, I've rolled with Yuri dozens of times. The guy is super strong. Like, you know, you got Yuri, you got Gordon, you got Mason, you got all these guys. They are big and strong. And so, I guess I would just, I wouldn't dismiss the power of strength. Uh for the power of mobility. I, I, I think you should be having both, but I think if you had to pick one, strength probably outweighs it. I think with, with jujitsu, where obviously you, you are trying to, you know, control people. I think if you're stronger, it requires less output to, to get a task done, right? So I almost feel like if you're weaker, you're having to put out more output to try and get the task done. And that's where you may get fatigue and may get injury. So I feel like from an injury perspective, I don't know, I feel like strength is really key for that yeah. as well. And I just don't think you ever see a, a situation where strength is a weakness or strength is a disadvantage. There's never a situation in grappling where strength is disadvantage or you are too strong there. Like it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, my buddy Mark Bell has a great saying, like strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. Um, you know, I think for... And, and look, again, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Like I've rolled with Kyle Terra and, uh, dude, he's, he wrist locked me four times in like four minutes. Right. <laughs> like, and it doesn't matter how strong I am. Right. Like it doesn't matter yeah. because he's so we'll highly technical and I'm giving him a ton of credit where credit's due there. Right. However, if all things were even strength definitely plays a, a, an advantage. Right. And, and the idea is to make yourself a well-rounded athlete so that, you have strong and capable joints and you're physically capable to do the things you want to go do. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Mate. Completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You've mentioned a couple of, uh, really sort of, um, well-known names that you've trained with me. And as you said, you're quite privileged in regard to the people you've got nearby to you. Thinking about the people that you train with, who, who, who is that the toughest, toughest role that you've experienced? 
Oh man. I mean, you know, I think that someone like a Kyle Terra is really interesting because he's, you know, he is a smaller competitor who's just so technical that could put himself in positions that are just so dominant. Right. And so he's, he's definitely unique. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of rolling with a lot of really, really high level guys. And every time I do it, man, I just get, I get humbled, but I also get humbled in the fact of just how good of training partners they are. Like mm. I've had the opportunity to roll with, you know, because of my CrossFit background, I've had, I've been blessed to roll with Uchesha and Ryan, Gordon Ryan and, and, uh, you know, you, m- many of these guys and never once have I felt like they were trying to show me up or hurt me or anything, right. They were just trying to be a good training partner for that day. Same thing with Mason. Um, and so that, that I think is a good testament to the sport of jujitsu is where the ego is, it, it just really gets taken out and people are just there to try and get the most out of it for themselves and for their training partner. I think, well, I think everyone in jujitsu at some point would have been humbled, wouldn't they? So then when they're on the other side of it, you do have that bit of, uh, well, they, they, they have that bit of reluctance to, to smash you because they just don't need to, because they know how good they are. And then they've been on the other end as well of someone probably being a dick to them and doing that to them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, jujitsu has this weird way of just like humbling because there's always someone better, bigger, uh, for most people, most of the time. Now there's exceptions to the rule. If you're like an ADC champ, uh, ADCC, but like, even if you are, you have had to come up in a world where you weren't. And so you've been humbled through that journey. And I think that when anybody puts on a belt that's black, they have spent the years to being in the gutter. And I think that it, it just impacts their mindset on, on everything, on the way that they walk out of the gym, the way they treat people, the way they are. Um, yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough for the benefits of jiu-jitsu. And I would say on that on that same lens, you know, the benefits of CrossFit. Because you go in there, you go out there, you go do hard stuff. You're competing against other people. You're quantifying your results. And you need to be humble about it because you realize that someone can do the same amount of work as you can in half the amount of time. And so I've been blessed since I was really young to be surrounded by people who, by sport, is like by design being humbled every day. And it's 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 good. Yeah, we've talked a couple of times actually about the uh, the crossovers between CrossFit and Jiu Jitsu in regards to like community and 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 social support. I think that's um, it's a really powerful thing, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, I mean, every week I host a free men's club where I just like get the guys in a parking lot and we go do free workouts. Um, and the idea is just to go shoulder to shoulder, just do hard things with other guys. And I think that there's something magical that happens there where you have this connection of shared shared suffering. And I think that happens on the mats, that happens in the gym. And I think that as a society, we need to pursue that even more and more and more because, you know, our life is getting more sedentary, more easy. And unfortunately, with that comes some downfall. And I think that you need to be intentional in your approach to try and go make friends through shared suffering. Yeah, completely yeah, agree. Hundred percent. Are you uh, are you a fan of jujitsu as a spectator at all? Do you watch ADCC and enjoy watching jujitsu? I, I just watched. So um, you know, Mason's a friend of mine. Uh, mm. Nikki Rod and I have done some stuff together. So um, I actually just watched their fight like uh, two days ago, and on um, UFC um, Fight Pass. So yes, I watch it. I will. I went to ADCC last year. I'll plan to go there again. So I'm a fan oh, from sick. afar, but I know some of these guys. So I become, you know, like I, I become invested in the journey because I get to know them as, as friends and I want to see them be successful. Yeah. You're the sort of person to uh, make predictions around who you think is going to maybe uh, win the absolute this year. Well, it depends if Gordon fights or not, depending on his stomach. Um, obviously, he would be the favorite. I think that's pretty clear. Um, even if he hasn't really fought too much this year, I think he would still be the favorite. Um, but, you know, Nicky Raw just had an impressive showing against Mason Fowler. I think Mason is absolutely a beast. Um, and, you know, it, it was impressive in the sense that obviously he won by points, but I think it was a very close match. I think that if they did that match again, who knows if the same outcome would have happened. So I think ADCC is kind of up for grabs. I think Yuri, who won the overall last year, you know, he went to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Singapore. He coached in Singapore for the last year, and then he came back to California now. So I don't know what his plans are for ADCC, but um, yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting either way. Yeah, because I think Yuri's due for the uh, super fight with Gordon if he's if he's well enough, right? That's right. That's right. 
Yeah, yeah. That'll be unbelievable, won't it? <laughs> mm. Yeah, it'd be interesting. <laughs> That'll be good. Uh, Jason, what's your nutrition like these days? I know, uh, I think in the past, you, you practiced a paleo diet, right? Yeah. I mean, I've done paleo, I've done zone, I've done all kinds of stuff. I'd say right now it's just eating real food. And I, you know, there's only so much you could have in like your discipline bucket. Um, my bucket is pretty big in terms of like training and consistency when it comes to food, you know, I'm not as, as crazy about it. I think food is fuel. I think it's very important. I think if you feel like shit, you got to look at that first. Um, but for me, it's like, you know, I sleep well, I hydrate well, and then I eat good enough. Like, is it perfect? Is it full paleo? No. Um, but it's, it's the lifestyle that makes me feel good. And so I think that asking yourself those questions is really important. Like, Hey, how do you feel? Well, on a regular basis, if you feel like your energy is crashing at 10 AM, it might be because you, you had a glass of orange juice and a banana and your blood sugar spiked and now you're crashing and you sleep like shit. You're not training consistently and you're not hydrating at all. So I think that people when they look at nutrition, they shouldn't just look at it in terms of like a vacuum. They should look at it holistically and say, Hey, what am I doing across these other things? And how's my nutrition? And what can I make a small tweak to that can make a big impact? Like I'll give you an example. When people come into the gym, they're like, Hey, I want to eat paleo and work out five days a week, seven days a week. I say, okay, why don't you just remove soda and come into the gym three days a week? Why don't you do that for a month? And then after a month, let's reevaluate and we'll add to that. But I think that the biggest mistake people can have when it comes to nutrition and training is going too hard, too fast. They get burnt out and then they, they don't come back. Couldn't agree more, mate. I say that with all of our clients. First thing I do is put them, just change the little bits, bits and pieces that they, they think are not important, but they're probably the most important parts. Um, you know, it's pillars, pillars of success, really. Yeah, there's a there's an oftentimes, especially in the culture lately of this biohacking culture where People want to get interested in red light therapy, sauna, cold plunge, uh, morning, whatever, right? And I have all those things. So I'm not like dismissing the value there. But you're, you're, you're majoring in the minors if all you're talking about is jumping in the sauna, but you're sleeping two hours a night or you're training only three days a week. Like it, it just doesn't – it's, it's – you got to get the, the, the order. You got to get the baseline going and then you can start stacking other habits on top of that. Yeah, no, you're right. It's uh, definitely a bit of a pyramid of uh, priority, I think, isn't it? People sometimes go straight to the, the peak of it. Yeah, try to do everything at once, don't they? Well, it's, it's, it's alluring too because it's, 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 it's not, it's not it, this, this other stuff I'm talking about is not very sexy. Like it's not sexy yeah. to say, hey, no, right. I'm hitting this morning. I hit a, you know, this workout or, or like, but it is sexy to be like, dude, I went in the cold plunge. I was there for five minutes. Like it's, it's just not as appealing and I get it. Yeah, no, very true, mate. It's definitely uh, definitely sells books and uh, and instructionals and everything else, doesn't it? For sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, in addition to being uh, an athlete and uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner, you obviously run a, a business as well, um, quite a successful business. I think it's a non-for-profit. Is that right? Uh, we have a non-for-profit arm. We have um, so the way the way I you know coming out of high school, um, excuse me, college, I opened up a gym, and those gyms are now called NC Fit, as in NorCal. We own and operate brick and mortar gyms. Those are not; those are those are for profit locations. Um, we also have a digital arm of that for gym owners and coaches called the NC Fit Collective. That's all for profit. We also have something that many people probably listening here would get value from, which is our Train Hard app. And we have three programs on there. One is called Force, which is just really good strength conditioning. Another is called Flex, which is functional bodybuilding. And then finally, we have an EMOM program, which is designed to like never allow your momentum to get to zero. Just like always give you something you could do. Then the third arm of our business, um, we do have a philanthropic side where we do um, pediatric cancer um, charity through something called Ava's Kitchen. My wife really spearheads that. And so that would be our, our not-for-profit philanthropic side. The other two, Train Hard and NC Fit, are for profit. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so, so a few arms. And then... Obviously, with the, the pediatric cancer side, I think that was from obviously being quite close to home, right, with your daughter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In 2016, she was diagnosed. Yeah. I mean, it's a great cause, mate. And I think Danny and I are both parents. So, so yeah, yeah, it's amazing, some amazing work. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it gives you a strong purpose. It gives you a strong, um, you know, going through what we've gone through and we've gone, there's still even more to come, you know, more that's been happening. Um, you just realize the importance of what I like to refer to as the AMRAP mentality, where you 
become present and focused on what you're doing. And you really try and build a hedge in your relationships, your financial hedge and your physical fitness. And the reason why those things are so important is because when shit hits the fan, which it might, and hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, you got to have those on lock and you can't go back and play catch up. It doesn't work that way. And if people want to check out these, uh, your app mate, and, and your services, where can they find them? Uh, I think, you know, obviously you could go to Jason Kleep on Instagram. You could go to th.fit as in train hard.fit. Um, but I, I, we also have a podcast. It's the Jason Kleep podcast. You can check it out there. Um, we just kind of talk to dads and people just trying to level up. And that's really my intention is to expose myself to as many people as possible to see from different perspectives. Yeah, we love a bit of that as well. And and when you when you're sort of thinking about sort of dads and and, and normal blokes like Danny and I that are trying to level up, what what's typically the message to them? I mean, the message is for me. I think it all comes back to training. For me, it it all comes back to physical capacity and fitness because that is what I know. That's what I've dedicated my life to, and that's what I've seen personally impact my life in more ways than I could count. When you show up at the gym, show up on the mats, show up in the garage. And you overcome that adversity, right? That struggle. Someone's got their arm across your face. Uh, you don't want to do that next push up. You don't want to do the assault bike intervals. Name the thing. It teaches you to overcome, right? It teaches you to compartmentalize, to positive self talk. It teaches you to understand what's in your control. It teaches you these life skills that you could then transfer off. And so, what I try and talk to dads about is this idea that, like, if you are not utilizing fitness because of like, wanting to look better naked. Like, okay, I get that. How about better health markers? Well, I mean, don't you want to be here for your kids? Like, that's pretty important. But how about the mindset? Like, how about that? Like, if you're not motivated by better blood markers to be here for your kids, to look better naked for your wife or significant other, right? Then how about the fact that when you go in, you hit a hard training session, you show up different for your family, your friends, and your community. You're the best example of yourself. And that should be the motivation to show up for others around you. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's what I talk yeah, that's about. That's great advice, though, mate. Great advice. Yeah, it is. I, I don't know if this is uh, a global thing, actually, but in the UK, it's Mental Health Awareness Week this week. In the United States, it's June for men. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we've got ours this week, and the the UK government at the moment are sort of driving a campaign which is which is move for mental health. So it's very much around the link between physical activity. And the impact, the positive impact that has on mental health. 100%. I, I just got done recording a podcast with this guy named David who was talking about physiology um, versus psychology and how, like, how impacting one's physiology, like their blood markers, all these types of things. Like a lot of people mistake the way they're feeling as a psychological issue, but maybe what it is, is physiologically, they're just out of balance. They're out of whack because they're sitting behind a computer all day. They're, they're not, they're, you know, and, and so it's important that yes, there's true mental health concerns and we need to address those hundred percent, but is the framework at the bottom of the base there? Are you physically active? Are you paying attention to these things? And then are you layering that on top, uh, with connection, friendships, whatnot? Now at that point, if you have all those things, Okay maybe there's something else, right? Past trauma, this, that. Um, but yeah, it, we had a great podcast on that particular subject. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really important subject, mate. And, you know, we talked recently about the fact that, you know, uh, again, I don't know what the guidelines are in the US, but the government here is just around physical activity and just walking, forget jujitsu, forget CrossFit, just movement, just basic physical activity. The recommendation is 150 minutes per week. So 30 minutes a day, across five days or 21, 21 minutes per day across seven days of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise. And maybe only a quarter of people in the UK in a recent study showed that they do moderate intensity to that amount of time. And I think only one in three people made any time at all to do vigorous intensity exercise in like the last, in the last 12 months. And I think 58% of, of that of that population who, who responded them said it was basically a lack of motivation was the main reason or the main barrier to them doing any activity. Um, we then talked about how motivation doesn't appear out of thin air, but it's really something that you kind of create through taking action and actually taking some first steps. What are your thoughts on motivation in that? Well, I mean, I think what you're talking to is an epidemic across 
many countries, especially the United States. And one of the things that scares me, especially as being a dad and a husband is like, if you don't expose yourself to moderate or even high intensity ever, like, what if you have to sprint? Like, dude, when's the last time that if, if, when's the last time that someone based on your statistics sprinted, like that's a problem. If you need to sprint and you haven't sprinted in 10 years, you're going to fall on your face and you know, and real, this is like a real life situation. Like, I mean, you have a, I mean, worst case, you have some type of active shooter and you can't run for a hundred meters. Like you're in trouble. Um, and I think that anyways, back to your point, motivation. Um, I think that it comes from this deep reflection on why you need to train in the first place. Like, I don't, I don't think we've done a good job as a society in talking about motivation to work out. I think we've been a little bit fixated on the aesthetic appeal, which I think is a factor for sure. Like you want to look good. Like I get it. And I think it's really easy to sell before and after pictures, but that only lasts for so long in somebody's season. Like if, Hey, I'm trying to get jacked for summer. Okay, cool. I got you. But how about after summer? Right. Um, and I think when you start really hitting someone at the heart, like, Hey, you're trying to be here for your kids. You're trying to be the fittest grandpa. You're trying to do these things. And they start kind of like mulling that over. It gives them something to latch onto. That's, that's like a, that's like a, a foundation and not just some superficial goal. So that's where I think motivation comes from is identifying what deeply internally is your why. And for me, that's connected directly with showing up for my family, my community and being as fit as and capable as I can for my kids. Yeah, I think thinking about sort of being a parent and and that being a motivation, it's funny because when you said about when was the last time I sprinted, it was after my four and a half year old. Dude, there because you go. Because he's he's quick. And one thing I see, mate, which which really makes me both sad and angry, I think, at the same time, but you see these obese parents um with children that are old enough to be running around and walking, and instead of that, they're strapped into a wheelchair or a buggy. Um, you know, normally on a phone, maybe eating ice cream or, or something like that. And and I often wonder if I wasn't as in shape as I am, and I'm not massively in shape, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm averagely in shape or, 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 well, not even averagely these days, but I, I can run. Um, I don't understand how these parents could run after a child if it ran off. They can't. And as a result, they, they strap them in chairs. So then you start seeing the next generation I guess, being inactive by default because of their parents. I mean, I, I, like, how do you tackle that, do you think? I mean, I think, you know, first off, one of the things I've had to learn is like, I don't pass judgment, I share insight. Like, if if someone has let themselves go, like, it's not, it's, I am not the judge to determine why that is. I am just here that when they are ready, I am here to provide them a path to improve wherever they're at. And that's something that's, that's hard, you know, like you see people in society, you want to judge them, but I've learned just through my experiences being, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the hospitals over the years. I've spent a lot of, you know, and shit comes up and people go through things. And I think what's important is for anybody listening to reflect on their community and their circle and to be a beacon, to be a light and not to pass judgment, like to be an inspirational figure in your community, to show them a way that is the way, meaning like it is the path. Like there is no path to not being able to get up out of a chair to chase off your four-year-old. That, there, that is not a path. That, that, is a, that, a, that is a path that we cannot allow to occur because for the longevity of our society and your family, it just won't work. So let me instead inspire you, but not, not, not berate you, not, not um, uh, crit criticize you, but instead inspire you. I think that's the way we need to approach it because people get turned off. If you're too aggressive, you, people get turned off if they're being told what to do, but if instead they just see their neighbor working out in their garage all the time, eventually they'll come over. And when you're there, they're ready, they know where to go. You know, that's something I think about all the time. Yeah. hundred percent. And do you think, um, social media and, and, and technology is going to I guess, again, add a sort of barrier or a reason for people to become less active as we move forward? Or do you think it's a source for good if you can use it correctly and inspire others? I mean, I think it's it's what it is. You know, I, again, I had a conversation earlier today and I was reflecting on social media as a tool, you know, um, equating it. This is a, 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 you know, some people might not accept this perspective and especially coming from the UK, but if you, equ if you equate it to firearms, 
So if, if your child has an interest in firearms and hunting one day, let's just say you have an obligation, in my opinion, as a parent to educate them on what it is, how it's used as a tool, but how it could also be severely dangerous and how you have to respect that tool all the time, right? And, and teach that at a, a fundamental level. If you look at that the same for social media, like it is a tool and it could be dangerous. Now, not it, 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 I'm not counting it exactly the same as a firearm, but the point I'm trying to make is that if you could educate your children on, hey, these are the algorithms, this is how it works, this is the business model, this is, this is what they're trying to do to you, and this, these are the dangers, then you could recognize that that tool has a lot of utility. It could connect you to the world. It could change your life in so many positive ways, but it could also do these things. And you could say that same thing about, you know, many other things that could cause you harm as a tool, but also be very useful at, at, in the same way. Yeah, completely agree. Jason, I know you've got to shoot in a second, mate. So uh, thank you very much for giving us some time. It's been, uh, it's been awesome chatting. Yeah, I've enjoyed it, mate. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I could, uh, we could talk about this kind of stuff all day, you know, jujitsu, <laughs> lifestyle training. I just think that my perspective on it is that like, identify what you want to do, why you want to do it, and then start creating a path towards it, start slow and then work your way up. That's it. And you know, I'm in this for the long game. And so should you guys be like, I'm 38. I'm trying to be super, super fit when I'm 90. And so if I have that mentality, I don't need to get results tomorrow. I just need to stay on the path until I'm 90. And chances are, if you stay consistent, you're going to be super jacked by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll certainly try, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you.